Welcome to The Jewish Diasporist, a podcast covering the social, cultural, and political implications of life in diaspora. I'm Zach Smarin. And I'm Ben Yanowitz. This week we have a podcast that's a little different from our past episodes. This podcast is primarily made up of content that was recorded during the time I was with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence during their delegation last month in Israel-Palestine. We participated in a number of different protest actions around Jerusalem Day and spent several days building playgrounds in villages in Masafriyata, which was really impactful as it's a very hard place to imagine growing up. And these villages were made up of so many children that being able to participate in building a playground for these kids was really inspiring. And I saw so many smiles and the radical joy while you're there was really visceral. That being said, this episode is not directly about the delegation itself, but it's about some of the stories of different participants and the sort of work that CJNV facilitates, as well as how it relates to the concept of diasporism. Because this is an episode that's a little different with multiple interviews throughout, we're going to include a table of contents with timestamps for the different segments in the show notes. So if you'd like to just jump ahead, feel free to do so, though, of course, I highly recommend listening to this through from beginning to end. It also includes an impromptu, accidentally recorded discussion, which took place while we were in Masafariata with several Eastern European activists who are based in Israel today. I wanted to share that discussion because while it was not something I would have recorded on my own, I think it demonstrates the sort of energy that we experienced over the course of the delegation within our own group, which was about 40 people, but also with the different groups that we engaged with and worked with. Because this is different interviews that were recorded over the course of a trip I was on, the sound quality is a little bit worse from past episodes. It's not recorded in studio environments. So I really hope that we have the content here make up for the slightly worse audio quality. As this was Ben's trip and experience, he will be the one taking the lead on the discussions in this episode. However, we have a few joint points of conversation throughout the podcast. I will talk about it a little bit from my perspective as well. I travelled to the West Bank in 2019. I visited a few cities, not with an official group, including Hebron, Nablus, Ramallah, Bethlehem, Janine. So I'll put my perspective into it as well. We would like to know very much what you think about this format. It's a little bit different from what we've done so far. There will be new ways to get in touch with us to receive feedback very soon. So stay tuned for that and enjoy this podcast. My name is Louisa Cornblatt. I was wondering if you could tell me a little about your upbringing, um, where you're coming from. Sure. So I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and grew up in a religious home, kind of in a context where there weren't a lot of other Jews. I think there are. There are more there now, but at the time, it really felt like I didn't have a lot of Jewish friends, and my family came. My mom had a sabbatical. She is an academic, and came to live in. Jerusalem when I was five. Um, and that experience was there for half a year, six months, I think. Um, from that, and then afterwards, my family became observant, became kind of Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat. And so growing up, I'm very proud to be Jewish. And there was always a narrative in our family that it takes work and it takes effort because we weren't surrounded by a lot of other observant Jews. And we came back from living in Jerusalem. How long were you living in Jerusalem? That was six months at the okay. time. Yeah, I went to Canada. I went to, I went to Ghana. I went to kindergarten. Um, here. Yeah. Whatever here is. <laughs> when we came back, it was definitely a source of pride and like a word different. And wouldn't it was so nice then to not have to work so hard to be Jewish. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was kind of like this exciting thing of having to make effort. And so there was always this like kind of yearning to come back. Mm-hmm. to Israel, Israel-Palestine, though really at the time we really were not talking about Palestine in my family. So it was always just the, like, wouldn't it be so nice to be to be surrounded by this and be able to like breathe Jewishness and not have to put in so much effort, which is in large part why my entire immediate family has now like, changed their center of life mm-hmm. and all are based in, in 
delegation. So we are here as part of a Center for Jewish Nonviolence delegation. I was wondering, because obviously that sort of Zionist upbringing definitely shifted at some point. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that sort of process of development and in your thinking. Yeah, it's funny even just saying that Zionist upbringing because as a kid, the word like Zionism wasn't so present. We weren't saying like, we're Zionists and we believe in a in a Jewish state or, you know, Zionist state. So my process of unlearning has been, it's been a bit confusing because I didn't think I was unlearning. You know, I thought I grew up in this kind of liberal leftist, white Ashkenazi American context. And there was a, like a yearning for the state of Israel for like cultural reasons. Yes, for religious reasons, linguistic reasons. My, my mom is a, a Russian literature professor and my family just like loves languages and so that was kind of a big pull and it wasn't this like we're proud Zionists mm-hmm. um and now later in life like looking back um retrospectively it's like oh no that was Zionism we just weren't really yeah. naming it and it's it muddled things for me like I almost wish I wish we just named the thing and recognize the Jewish supremacy that was deeply ingrained would you say that there was no difference between Zionism and Judaism in that yeah perspective? it was very much that it was kind of like oh I can't even possibly begin to disentangle Judaism and Zionism because there's like we say that in our liturgical texts talk about Zion and how could I ever how could those be mutually exclusive you know it wasn't thought about right. Zionism as a political ideology it was very much ingrained or enmeshed with what it meant to be Jewish. And there was also this like differentiation from I have extended family here who very much are Zionists, are Tilu Mi and and right wing. And so it was like, oh, we're not them. Like they're Zionist and we're not that. So there was like a distancing in a sense of Zionism, but it still was, it still was Zionism, you know, it still was liberal Zionism. Like, I didn't realize even 10 years ago, I thought I was already, you know, I would have said I was anti-occupation. I wasn't comfortable using the word apartheid and saying anti-apartheid, but I didn't, I didn't really know what that meant. And I didn't know what it, what it meant to act upon being anti-occupation and what that would look like. And I, I can't say that I necessarily know what, what that is now, but it's funny how the hindsight, you know, hindsight of like, oh no, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to do this kind of, this radical work that I'd been engaged in. So how did that sort of move? away yeah. from that in hindsight yeah so i lived here i moved to, to tel aviv after undergrad and i'd also lived in jerusalem when i was 15 um, like a half year it's part of the rama the conservative rama movement so it's a zionist program and i moved after college and really was not ready to engage in anything around Palestinian liberation like would have said yes i'm anti-occupation again but i was I was very much that kind of narrative, like, oh, let's focus on like internal issues first and thought those could be disentangled. That's a strategy that I feel like Zionists often use. Oh, let's focus on the economic and the socio, you know, political context within the borders. And yet, as we know, like, what are the borders? Like the 48 borders, seven borders, what does that even mean? So at the time I was getting involved in issues related to asylum seekers, largely from Eritrea and Sudan. I was in a theater group with women who had left sex work who had left prostitution and was not getting anywhere near Israel-Palestine issues and apartheid and occupation. And so I was here for three years and was like, I just want to do some of that political work, but I want to just live and work as a waitress and improve my Hebrew because a lot of the pushback I'd gotten from family, this extended family I mentioned before that are religious and Zionist was like, you don't get to have an opinion. You don't live here. You don't really know. You haven't experienced the national trauma. And so after college, I was like, you know what, screw it, I'll move here so I can have opinions. So I was like, okay, but in order for me to have opinions, I need to like really immerse myself first and I need to have better Hebrew and be able to have a conversation in Hebrew even and not be discounted, which then kind of delayed me from getting involved in organizing and activist work around anti-occupation. So I was scared and felt ill-equipped. And honestly, I still do. Like I still feel really ill-equipped for conversations. And then I left and I went to Berkeley for our graduate school quite a different space (laughs) yeah and it was and that was really confusing because again I was like I'm this leftist I I have radical politics I was involved in different abolitionist and transformative justice spaces but I wasn't ready to say like I'm anti-Zionist and I had a lot of folks that were like skeptical of me of my whiteness of my connection to Israel I had made Aliyah like I did have citizenship and I knew 
family was here. I was confused around my sense of home. Like my parents had moved, so I didn't have immediate family in the U.S. anymore. I was like, oh, my home is there. And I just had like these different complicated, again, still do, feelings coming up, especially in spaces in the Bay Area. But I then started feeling like, okay, if and when I'm going to come back to Israel-Palestine, I have to be engaged in anti-occupational work like I have to. I don't know what that means or looks like. I don't necessarily have any connections. I don't know the people. I don't know who's doing that, but I can't be living in that place. So again, it was really more just like dreaming about it, but I didn't know how to actualize it. Was there any like moment that really made you reprocess that? I know we kind of talked about that. Yeah, I, I had a, there was a friend that I had started to get to know at Berkeley who was really anti-Israel, anti-apartheid, and would say to me at the time, like really radical things, wouldn't refer to Israel, would just call it 48. And that was like a really hard thing for me to wrap my mind around of like, wow, she's like delegitimizing and denying. And now I like really don't say Israel that much. I often do refer to Israel as 48. So it's funny to think about how that made me feel. You know, she wasn't Palestinian. She was from the Middle East. So I remember that person saying something to me like, I could imagine if I was Palestinian living in that context, like I could engage in violence. Like I could see myself being a suicide bomber. And I was like, whoa, that's really heavy and hard to hold. And I don't know how to hold that. That makes me feel scared and it makes me feel angry. And, you know, like I have family and friends that have lost people and been impacted by violence. And, you know, at the time it made me panic a bit, you know, and ultimately the friendship couldn't last because of where I was at and where she was at. And there was a moment, I think it was spring of 2021, this was a story I was telling you earlier. I was visiting, I was back in Tel Aviv for a bit. I don't even remember if there was a lot of missiles being sent into Gaza and, and different raids and a lot of death committed by the state of Israel, vulnerable folks living in Gaza. And, and I got an email from this person who we were not in touch and she said something like, I hope you realize now that you're on the wrong side of history. And I got that email right after there had just been a siren in Tel Aviv and I'd had to shelter in like a garage space. And I was separated from my family at the time. I was by myself. Or actually, I had just run into someone I hadn't seen in like 10 years. And we ended up running into this garage together. And getting that email from her, like even though at that time I already knew like, you know, there's Iron Dome here. There's no chance of this siren. Like even just the experience of there being a siren can be a scary thing. But also like we're not vulnerable in Tel Aviv by any means. There's all of these mechanisms to protect civilians. And so few rockets sent out from Gaza actually make contact and cause actual damage. That being said, that does happen. Anyway, so I just come from that contact and, and then got this email from this woman that I wasn't in touch with. I was upset, but also was like, I know what's happening in Gaza is not okay. Like, I know what Israel is doing is not okay. And at the time, individually, I was dealing with some traumatic things separate from an Israel-Palestine context and was like kind of in a dark place in my life. And I was like, she doesn't have any idea where I'm at and what's happening. But also now I'm like, that doesn't really matter. Like I'm still connected to a larger context that regardless of what as an individual I was going through, like I'm still complicit and still yeah. implicated. It was a shifting point, but still I wasn't ready. Yeah, just on that moment, like during that escalation in 2021, I was in New York City. And I remember going down the street. I was already rather there. I remember I was in the city and we walked into not one, but like two different pro-Palestine protests. And one of which had a large Jewish contingent. I remember seeing banners with like Jewish anti-fascist front, Jews against apartheid. There was like a large Jewish block at those protests. And it was really powerful to see that. And just thinking about like the sort of simultaneousness of those different events. Interesting yeah. to think about. Yeah. So you've been involved with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence rather extensively in this last year. You were involved in their Hineinu Fellowship. I was wondering if that furthered your development or anti-Zionism, non-Zionism, I don't know where you identify as. Did that precede that or I was just kind of curious about the connection yeah. and going into the community. Yeah, I mean, I think because I ended up back in Tel Aviv in November, staying with family, and then I like heard about Hineinu like a week before I think the application was due. And I was like, I think this is what I need to do. I don't I know I'm in a transitional period in life, not sure where I'm headed next. And I was like, yeah, spending three months in the South Hebron Hills engaged in daily pro-resistance solidarity with Palestinian partners sounds like exactly where I need to be. And so I think I was ready, you know, like at that point upon applying, because I heard it. I was like, I need to do this. And I'd heard about CJ and V. For many years, I had a friend that had done the delegation in 2019. And when around the time when CJ and V was coming to be, I was connected, I think, back in like 2014, 2015, when there were conversations on the ground because I was living in Tel Aviv at the time and was kind of tangentially connected to folks. But again, that was the period where I was like scared and didn't quite know and wasn't, wasn't ready. But I was hearing about CJ and V already, had a lot of respect. And so when I found out about Hineinu, 
I was like, okay, this is an organization. Like, I can stand behind this. It's so freeing and liberating when you find an organization that you can trust and you get their values and you're on board. And so you're like, okay, they're doing a thing. Okay, you know, you don't have to spend all that time assessing if they're doing the work you want to be doing. Like, I already had a lot of trust. I already knew folks connected. I was like, this is what I want to be. But yeah, definitely the experience of living in the Safriata for three months and just the daily in and out of seeing the occupation. Like, it astounds me that I think it's like a third of... Israeli citizens don't believe there's an occupation. Like the militarized presence, like turning on the water and there not being any, you know, there's suddenly being no electricity, the constant flying checkpoints where you're like trying to get somewhere and you have to reroute or you get stopped. Like it boggles me that there are people that either are so far removed from the reality, which is a lot, and like you don't have to see it, or they've bought in so, so deeply to the narrative of like, this is for security and this is the only way and there's no way to dream for a different future. To the point that then they're like, it's not an occupation. Still, it does not make sense. I was ready pretty early on to be like, yeah, this is apartheid. Like, people are treated differently based on their religion, ethnicity, and race. Like, that's the definition. Early on, there's a game Orializer had made. Whose apartheid is it anyway? And it's basically comparing South African apartheid laws with Israeli laws. And you have to guess and like, played it as a group. And I failed. Like, I did it with a partner. And I think we got like 65%. I was like, okay. Sometimes we were able to differentiate just based on like, oh, that's the kind of like vocabulary and language that sounds more like something that, you know, South African are versus Israeli. But that's wild. Like if you can't, if you can't yeah. distinguish between laws and you're, you're confusing them between apartheid South Africa and wow. apartheid Israel Palestine. Like, yeah, that's nuts. I feel like there's still a lot of hesitancy among a large, I'd say probably the vast majority of the Jews have some sort of gut reaction to the word apartheid being used to describe what exists here in Israel Palestine. So just hearing that you can't tell the difference, that you could be confused between that, that's nuts and really, I think, sends the point home and just what exists here, you can't really deny it. Yeah, people do. Like, I took a risk and posted something on my Instagram, and I really am not on social media very much, and I posted something, like, in the first few weeks about, like, this is apartheid. These are different examples of some of the things I've seen. Like, there's no trash pickup, so folks are forced to burn their trash because there's no infrastructure, despite it being an area C, and being the responsibility of the Israeli government to provide those civil services. You know, and someone responded, like, we need to check what the definition of apartheid is. Like, it's a specific time in history. Like, if that's how we're discounting it, if it only existed between these particular years, and that's the only thing that can be apartheid. If that's your way to discredit using that language, but there's something so powerful and important about naming it and saying apartheid. And there's like top Israeli government officials and politicians that do say that it's apartheid, both on the left and on the right. You know, there's a particular legal outpost. It's the South African guy that started it, I think he came in, in the 90s. And there's an interview clip of him being like, he converted to Judaism. His name is Yaakov Talia. And they're like, why did you convert to Judaism? Like, why did you come here? And the guy's literally like, I love apartheid. That's why I came. Wow. That's so Folks explicit. on the left and the right that are just like, yeah, this is apartheid. So let's just, let's name it. You know, like, and it's mm -hmm. taken a lot of different big human rights, but sell them. It's taken a bit, but in the past few years, two, three years, like people are saying it and naming it. And when we can name a phenomenon, like, then it can sometimes be a little bit easier to confront it, right? Like what I was saying earlier about, like, my family not saying Zionism and not saying, like, we're Zionists out front delayed my, like, process a bit. I wish that we could have just said, oh, yeah, we're Zionists, and I would have known what to push against. I would have mm -hmm. known what I was confronting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you've been involved with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence, and it sounds like it really did impact you in a really profound way. This delegation, for me, it's the first time I've been back here in six years, and I came into this somewhat similar to you, where it's like, I want to be here in a way that's authentic to this sort of transition that I've made. And it's powerful being here and being involved in this sort of work, and I really do think it's something that can allow Jews, whether they're living here or throughout the rest of the Jewish world, that we can actually be engaged in this sort of co-resistance and solidarity work on the ground. I was wondering if there's any sort of last points in terms of the way you think that we can go forward with this sort of work and how to scale it up so that we can really make an impact here on the ground. Yeah, the scaling up question is hard because the first thing that came to my mind is like it's so based in relationships, like doing relational activism, relational organizing. And going back to like how I trust CJ and V is like, I trust the folks that have been doing this work for years and the relationships that they've built. Like I'm coming in to a network that's been nurtured and cared for and loved and continues to be. Like you can't assume that a relationship that was fostered 
10 years ago is going to be the same today. Like there's like constant maintenance and love put into these relationships with Palestinian partners, with international folks and funders, donors, and people that are coming here, kind of all different directions. I mean, scaling up is just bringing more people in. I have a lot of respect for how CJMV speaks really expansively. You know, like as soon as we name a thing, right? If we name anti-Zionism apartheid, you're going to lose, you're inevitably going to lose some people. They're just, they're not going to come in. They're not going to come into the tent. And so it's a really kind of fine line to walk that I think CJNV does really gracefully and really beautifully. But you can only not name a thing so long. What are the things that we want to name, the injustices that need to be named? And then where can we be a little bit more expansive to get more people in for those conversations to come and really meet people and hear the stories on the ground? And I don't have an answer. Like, I think it's yeah. a constant, it's a constant balance, a constant struggling, but it's about relationships. And that's participating in Hinenu and this delegation. I've said it to folks in my life. There's no going back to who I was before. Like, I just can't. And I don't want to. A lot of it is, it's the relationships that I've built. It's the new frameworks I'm operating from. And I'm really yeah. grateful for that. But it's, it's about, yeah, it's about the relationships. Yeah, just one point I want to make is what we're doing on this podcast is really trying to lay the groundwork for diasporism as a concept, kind of counterposing against Zionism, going beyond just a more empty space that is anti-Zionism, that's just opposition to Zionism, mm -hmm. and having a more holistic understanding of diasporism as a concept that we can relate to here, but also relate to the places that we live. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a Jewish concept, it's about radical intercultural exchange. It's about finding ways for, I mean, I was just talking with Rabbi Cooper, Gare, the idea mm -hmm. of the resident outsider, for all of these people to be able to be embraced wherever they live. And I think that's something that is so applicable to here. Rabbi Cooper was saying that both Israelis and Palestinians are Gareem to each other. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that really powerful. And I do think diasporism and organizations like CJNV, which I would say is a diasporous organization, it's about building these connections that really are the only way that we can really have the change we need. Because just as apartheid was ended in South Africa, it has to be a global movement. Okay. And it has to be Jews especially, but it also has to be people around the world coming together to fight for justice. And it's been amazing to be here with CJNV because I think, as you're saying, only relationship building can make it possible to really challenge what exists here. And I look forward to the future where we can look back on this moment and recognize that this is a moment where the tides are beginning to change. And I really hope that that comes sooner than sooner. Well, That's thank great. you so much. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Bye. So a little interjection here. We've heard Louisa describe the situation in Israel-Palestine as apartheid. That word brings up a lot of emotions. It brings up comparisons, of course, to South Africa, which governed under a system of apartheid for nearly 50 years. It conjured up images of separate places to live, separate documentation, but also more, more forms of, of petty uh, discrimination of separate benches, for example, of separate beaches. And a lot of people, even those who are very critical of the current Israeli government all over the diaspora, view the term apartheid as either inaccurate or slanderous, used as a slur specifically outlining the case against the Jewish state, as is the perception. It's a conversation that we hear more and more about in our communities, and I think it's important to discuss this a little bit further. Ben, we've both been on the ground, but you've been there only a few weeks ago. We haven't been around to describe with our own eyes what we saw as apartheid. Obviously, there have been a lot of other people. How do you view this perspective? Well, that's a good question. I've done a lot of research as a historian on Palestine-Israel and Zionism and the history there. And for a long time, I didn't feel comfortable using the word apartheid, whether it was because I just didn't think it was accurate or it was a strategic choice. And I didn't think apartheid was a good word to use in the sense that a lot of people just have a trigger reaction to it. For a long time, like a year and a half, I used the term hafrada, which is Hebrew for separation, because one, it's the term that Israelis use to describe it, but also because it's good to recognize what makes what's going on in Israel distinct, what makes it different. Because... As you pointed out, South Africa is the seminal understanding of apartheid. The term apartheid comes out of the South African context, and what's going on in Israel-Palestine is different. 
especially when you look at this varying degrees of persecution and racism that Palestinians face, whether it's in the 48 borders in which Palestinians can legally vote. Of course, they couldn't until 67. Or they could vote, they just couldn't form political parties, but they were living under military rule. But today, those in the 48 borders, they are able to vote. So there isn't necessarily the same sort of degree of oppression as Black people endured in South Africa. However, there is unity between what's going on in the 48 borders and what's going on in the West Bank. What's going on in the West Bank, I think, is unequivocally apartheid. Noam Chomsky, despite the recent controversy around him, did say it best in his book with Elon Pape on Palestine that what's going on in Israel proper, scare quotes around that, is not apartheid. It's, it's persecution, it's racism, but it's not apartheid. However, what's going on in the West Bank is worse than what apartheid was like in South Africa. We visited Area C. We did not visit Area A and B. For those that might not be aware, areas A, B, and C were set up in Oslo II in the 90s. Area C is under entirely Israeli control. Area A is under entirely Palestinian Authority control, nominally. And Area B is under Palestinian Authority civil control and Israeli military control. And the thing is, there is unity across these zones, including in Israel proper. One of the Palestinians we met with when we were there made the point that you can't see the occupation in Area A because you don't have the same things that are going on in Area C, which we witnessed. I visited Masa Furyata. Masa Furyata has been in the news a lot since last year when the Supreme Court that now the so-called Demokratia protests are supporting legalized the firing zone that was established by Ariel Sharon in the 80s. Basically, there's about 3,000 people that live in Masa and 1,200 of which live in this firing zone. And what that decision legalized is that every building in these communities is under constant threat of demolition. We visited this village called Sfai, which is a beautiful little community. The average age is probably like 12 or 13. Like there were so many young children and they were so excited. I quite literally have never felt more welcome. Most of them didn't speak a word of English, a couple of them did, but like there was a time where I was doing a little bit of journaling and processing and three kids that didn't speak any English just sat down and watched me do that because they were so excited to just see what was going on and just to feel like they were supported from the international community. And then when we woke up the next morning, I woke up early because to be honest, I didn't sleep really that first night. You could see down the hill from where we were, there was the rubble of what had been until February this year, a school. And we did a, a tour with our main Palestinian activist, Go Between, who took us into what had been the school. It's a pile of rubble. And one thing that he said that really stuck with me was that these people have no hatred in their hearts. And honestly, that is true. The welcome that I received the night before was, again, the most welcomed I've ever felt in a community space like this. And I was a complete stranger. But that didn't stop the Israeli government from saying, oh, you built this without a permit. And of course, they can't actually get a permit because the body that issues those permits is filled with settlers that are not going to let them get the permits they need to build a school. Even though they're paying money to get those permits, it's getting rejected. So they said, we're going to build it anyways, and they built it. I believe it was a week later after it was built, and this was funded by donors, that a bulldozer came with the army, and they destroyed it with the kids inside. The kids literally had to jump out the window. And that same army is the IDF that all 18-year-old Israelis are forced to join. In that moment, I really stopped feeling comfortable calling it the Israeli Defense Force because you can't call it defense what they're doing there unless it's explicitly Israeli defense. And even so, if it's about security, you wouldn't be destroying these children's schools, destroying wells, destroying homes, destroying roads, making it so that these people cannot live a normal life. If it was about security, they wouldn't be doing it because what that does puts hate in these people's hearts. And in the West Bank, this is apartheid. There are Israeli settlements that are in the firing zone that the Israeli army will let be there and actually even support with infrastructure, with water and electricity and roads. And then there'll be Palestinian villages that if they try to even build a new room on their house, will have their entire house demolished. That is two legal systems for two different people in the same place. That is apartheid. And yes, it's varying from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. But the fact on the ground is that Israelis have control and have the power and that's a little different in areas A and B. But at the end of the day, the Israeli government is the one that has the power in this situation. 
and enforces these rules and created these rules and makes it so that Palestinians, whether they live in the 48 borders or in the West Bank or in Gaza, it makes it so that they do not have control over their lives. They are subjugated by this state that wants to destroy their identity or try to rewrite Palestinians in Israel's identity as Israeli Arab to divide and conquer these people. And at the end of the day, you can't have peace in Palestine, Israel, if you're not willing to confront the unity across this space. Jewish Currents just released a podcast with Basil Adra, the son of Kifa Adra that we visited. Kifa is a really incredible woman we actually met with. And I highly recommend checking out this podcast as it goes into a lot more depth than we're going in here. And we'll put the link to it in the show notes. But understanding the plight of Masafriyata and how interconnected it is to the rest of what is going on in that land is really crucial to understanding the current moment we're in in Palestine-Israeli politics. And I do think we need to start being more comfortable to calling out what it is, because the fact is, arguing over the word apartheid itself only leads us to more confusion rather than actually having the clarity we need. But honestly, I think the term apartheid can help us have that clarity, especially when it comes to building that anti-apartheid coalition around the world to end apartheid, as happened in the South African case. To discuss fully what we describe as policies of apartheid, or a term that I use every now and then when I discuss these issues within Jewish communal spaces, is institutional racial discrimination and separation, which is practically the same thing when we're talking from a legal standpoint. Because it is important to remember that apartheid is both in the popular conception, the system that existed in South Africa, but from the legal conception, clarified in many international treaties, including the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, describing crimes of apartheid. It's a specific set of policies that is not limited to a carbon copy of what is taking place in South Africa. Most of the policies of apartheid that is described takes place within or around situations in the occupied territories, but there are also very clear policies of discrimination or policies that might be race blind but result in discrimination within 48 Israel. One of those being the policies of Judaizing the Galilee and the Negev, which have been pursued by the Israeli state since 1949. The language of that itself is enough to make people realise across the world, I think, that this is not just the case of a state being institutionally racist, as Britain or America or Brazil or wherever might be, but it is a state that has reached a certain other point. To give the example, it would be very difficult to imagine even under the current government in Britain, for the government to say that we need to anglify areas of South London, perhaps. You know, Brixton needs to be made more British and make that an explicit element of government policy and also encourage people to settle in Brixton or Newham and encourage separate cities, some of which would receive much more possibilities for development and, and funds and so on. I just wanted to add one more thing about how a lot of people see what's going on in Israel-Palestine and try to date it, like, oh, this started with the Oslo Accords, or this started in 67, or this started in 48. I do think it's important to recognize that this is something that goes back at least to the 1920s with what was called the Jewish labor policy of the Histadrut, what became the Israeli labor movement in the 1920s, where they did have a policy of explicit segregation between the Jewish economy and the Palestinian economy, because they didn't want to intertwine these societies. They wanted to make it so that they were separate. There were people speaking out against that. There were people that said, we should be actually building cooperation between Jewish and Arab partners. But the majority of the Zionist organization said, no, organizing Palestinians is not in our long-term interest. So they didn't. And in that moment, the seeds of what we see today were sown. They could have refounded Zionism on a fundamentally different basis of Jewish-Palestinian cooperation. But instead, they closed the door to any such future. You can't settle a land and expect the indigenous people not to resist. And they knew that. Instead of trying to build bridges of peace, they built up walls of iron, and Zionism has moved ever further to the right, as they hold to the strict belief that the whole land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea must belong to the Jewish people exclusively. We could talk about this for hours, and this isn't the first time we've talked about this on this podcast already, and it won't be the last, so we'll just stop this here. 
Up next, we have an interview with Sam Stein, a journalist who is on the delegation. He spoke a little bit about some concrete examples of what apartheid looks like in practice. And I think he really does a good job of demonstrating how we as diasporist Jews can engage with Israel-Palestine, especially because he, as an American Orthodox Jew, moved to Israel, not because he's a Zionist, but precisely because he is an anti-Zionist. I hope you enjoy. I grew up in Long Island, New York, in a town called Lawrence, which is basically a bunch of rich Orthodox Republican Jews LARPing as wasps. Yeah, a lot of like really politically conservative Jews trying to reconstruct the power dynamic of white supremacy with themselves on top after the Holocaust and Jewish trauma in Eastern Europe instead of embracing liberation for everyone. So... We've talked already. I know that you consider yourself an anti-Zionist and still had a Orthodox upbringing. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about your political development and how you navigate between those sort of identities. Yeah, definitely. I always had a pretty strong criticism of my upbringing and specifically the politics that I was raised on or even just the social values that I was raised on. There was a kind of very obvious homophobia and racism and misogyny that I was exposed to from the adults in the community and my role models. That was like just obviously wrong to me. And then there's things that are more subtle that are harder to refute if you don't have sufficient political education and language around these things. Like a prominent example to me that I really believed in bootstrap theory as a kid, uh, because it makes sense if you don't know about mechanisms of oppression to just, you know, try harder. <laughs> but that cynicism never really extended to Israel or Zionism or Palestine. I kind of just accepted the narrative that I was raised on. Um, Though I do remember when I was 12, I think during the disengagement from Gaza, when our rabbis were, you know, talking about that a lot. One of my rabbis going on some tirade about how, quote unquote, they just want to kill us and it's our land and they just want it because we have and if we left, they wouldn't really even want it anymore. And I remember thinking that there must be a class of, you know, a classroom of 12-year-old Palestinian kids thousands of miles away getting the exact same rant about us. So even though it was, you know, very both sides, <laughs> that was kind of my earliest really dissenting thought on the issue. Not that that really materialized into anything deeper than that, just kind of that thread of doubt of like, how can you just be so certain about all of this? But my family came to you know would go to israel for vacation all the time basically every other year and at my bar mitzvah when i was 13 i read the torah at the kotel and then i did a gap year in this very right wing mechina program which is a, an army prep program in an illegal settlement called Efra, and i had no idea what that meant at the time i made zero distinction between the west bank and what's internationally accepted and recognized as israel it was all israel to me and the first time I ever heard the phrase, the green line, was after getting accepted to that program and someone saying to me, ooh, pass the green line, such a good Zionist. So all I knew at that point was that there was this thing called the green line and being passed it made me a better Zionist. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's that's really dark. I can see how that would really start to like make you more critically thinking about it, especially if it's better for being on the other side <laughs> of the green line. It's funny because initially it definitely had the opposite effect of like, ooh, cool, I'm being a good Zionist, which is like universally a good thing. <laughs> Obviously. And I was on this gap year program and there were definitely things that I observed at the time that really had an impact on me. And I finished this year having zero robust understanding of what occupation is and, you know, Palestinians living under military law and literally not having equal rights in the most obvious way. The day I left this gap year program, I left with zero improved understanding of the fact that this is, according to the entire world, not Israel. I think that's an interesting place to shift a little bit. So you were very Zionist growing up. You went to Israel a lot, you did Mechina, which is problematic. When did you start to shift around your politics of Israel-Palestine? The shift actually started in college, but for more, you know, background of the things leading up to that, you know, I was living in the West Bank and 
even if you have zero robots understanding of what that means, there's certain things that's impossible to just not see and not have affect you. Most notably, the fact that Palestinians had different license plates is always just like obviously weird to me and just obviously reminiscent of, you know, American segregation. You just scream whites only. And the fact that the checkpoint going in and out of the West Bank is one directional, you only get checked when you're leaving. I think in my head I was at the time I was just like, oh, security. But, you know, it's because they don't care about Israelis and internationals going in. They only care about making sure Palestinians don't go out. So those kind of stuck in my head. And I kind of, as a friend of mine very eloquently said, like put it in a box and didn't think about it. And then I got to college. I remember like early on in college, an Israeli guy who was at the Hillel Club at my college just ranting about how horrible the Israeli government was. I don't even remember if it was about the occupation or Palestinian rights or apartheid. It almost certainly wasn't about those things, but it was just the first time I'd ever seen a Jew express that like visceral disdain for the reality here. It was kind of like, oh, you can do that. <laughs> and then one of my best friends who I grew up with, you know, in like different schools, but the same community, very similar conservative background and orthodox religious upbringing, who actually spent two years in yeshiva studying Torah in the old city. And he just started talking a lot about the occupation and being very vocally anti-occupation. And that was, you know, a real defining moment of just having to really think, oh, well, I was taught that all this stuff is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And I really don't think that my best friend who went to yeshiva for two full years and is to this day still orthodox is an anti-Semite. So that really got the ball rolling of just like warming me up to that idea of like, hey, this is a real thing that I'll have to grapple with, even if I haven't picked a side just yet. And then my last year of college, this Palestinian guy came and spoke at the Hillel. Hillel really <laughs> played a very great role in my anti-Zionist journey. They'd be thrilled about that. I don't even know what he spoke about. I assume he came to spoke about some stupid palatable coexistence stuff. I don't remember what it was. All I remember is that before he even really got started, he mentioned, you know, this is like background information that he was from Bethlehem. And that really resonated with me because Bethlehem is right next to Ephrat the settlement that I lived in. And I remember very naively thinking, oh, we were neighbors, which is kind of true if you ignore the giant wall between us. <laughs> and, you know, right. Um, <laughs> and then during his whole spiel, he mentioned all of the permits and process you need to go through to get permission to go to Jordan to fly to New York. You know, comparing that to my experience of not being born there, being this American guy who was just there to study for the year and be in this program, just landing and walking around like I own the place and doing whatever I want. You know, the checkpoint leaving the West Bank was like a joke for us. We were these like riled up 18 year olds that were just saying like, what's the dumbest song we could blast on our car radio while driving to the checkpoint and just like get stupid laugh out of the soldiers that way. And for this person, it became very obvious after listening to him for, you know, a few minutes that the checkpoint was very real for him. And I remember thinking at a point for sure in my development where this was still a loaded term, and I think even on a more national level, at least in the Jewish community, with where the use of the word apartheid was even more controversial than it is now, I just remember thinking, oh, that's apartheid. That's really interesting hearing the Palestinian side and comparing your experience to his experience at the exact same, I don't know if it was the same checkpoint, but the exact same sort of situation and just the complete dichotomy between it just being a joke and it being like a very real, potentially even scary experience for him. I really wanted to thank you for making that point. Because one of the points we're trying to delve into into this episode is the use of the term apartheid to describe what's going on there. And I think the example you just gave really demonstrates why it is a useful and even important term, because ultimately you do have two systems of laws for two different populations. And the legal word to describe that is apartheid. So part of what made me really want to talk to you on this in this context was the fact that you are an anti-Zionist Jew who actually moved here. You immigrated to Israel, which I think a lot of both Jewish and non-Jewish leftists would assume that like anyone that moves to Israel is by their nature a, a Zionist, a, a settler, someone that is here to entrench the system of apartheid that exists in this place. I was wondering sort of your thinking and why you moved to this place and how that really fits into your political view as well as we'll get into it after the groups that you've been involved with. Yeah so like I said I came here a lot as a kid and really you know just developed a connection to the land when I came here for the first time when I was five 
I remember having this feeling of like, oh, we're going to Israel, like not like, oh, we're going to the state of Israel that was founded in 1948. To me, we were going to the land of Israel that you read about every single day in school and that you know all these stories about and that you're told over and over again is like the holiest place on earth. I can very definitively say that that never really went away, even while I was unlearning and learning so many things and completely reevaluating how I viewed the entire reality. I just still loved being here and still wanted to move here the way I did after finishing that far right gap year program when I was 18. I like to joke that I drank the Kool-Aid and just put my own ingredients in it. This is definitely something I credit to my orthodox background and the framing that we have around the land and Zionism was that they were different things. And if you grow up with your entire connection to this arbitrary chunk of land, if your only connection to it is the modern state of Israel and that in the late 1800s this movement started to found a Jewish ethno state here and if you abandon that project first of all that's a much more tumultuous moral realization and political journey in a lot of ways and second of all then there's nothing left so you're kind of like okay why, why would I ever go there and for me when I was able to abandon the idea of the Zionist project and the movement going on here it was still the Holy Land, it's still Eretz Israel. And I thought about it a lot, a lot of different things, you know, kept recurring while I was making the decision. Basically, I applied to grad school at Tel Aviv University and at Hunter College in New York. And Tel Aviv University got back to me first. And I remember thinking, okay, I'll wait for Hunter to get back to me and then I'll decide. And after about two weeks of realizing that I was hoping that Hunter would reject me, I just got in front of that bullet and made the decision to move here and just think critically about that and do it in the best way I can. And to me, it was almost this deal with myself of like, okay, we're doing this, but you need to be active the second you land, like, or you're complicit. I think that's really powerful in terms of the just inherent complicity in the system of being here as a Jew, but also thinking about how in a way, you can be more subversive towards the system if you are present in this place. Like being from the U.S. and currently living in England, it's easy to talk about it and it's easy to have the discussions that I do think are very necessary, but you can't have that sort of same direct impact on the system that you can here. So what does that look like to you? How do you engage with subverting the system and challenging it? Right away, as you said, there is like a certain weight of potential that I have as a Jew here and that even factored into when I got citizenship there was definitely an aspect to it of oh I can get away with more now I can't be deported and in terms of what my actual work and activism here has been pretty shortly after moving here I got involved with a group called All That's Left it's a completely non-hierarchical anarchist grassroots collective nobody is in charge and there's no pecking order and I'm really grateful for that structure because as someone that had no activist experience before, there wasn't the sense of like, you need to earn the privilege to take on certain roles and responsibilities. I heard about a meeting, I showed up and I left that meeting on two different committees. And almost four years later, I'm still incredibly involved. And one of my friends joked once that I was as involved after about a month as I am now, because that was actually possible. Yeah, with all that's left, I do a lot of on-the-ground direct action. It's very about the fact that we all exist in this physical space and utilize that fact. So a lot of shepherd accompaniment, joining Palestinian shepherds to A, just be usually white-skinned Jews that exist as a sort of shield because being white-skinned Jews is a protective presence because if you're a crazy radical settler that wants to violently force all these Palestinians out of the land to take it over, you can just go and attack them and do whatever you want to them and there's not going to be any legal repercussions because that's what the state and the project wants. But you can't really do that to us. There is an extent to which we forfeit a certain level of privilege just by being left as working against the state. It's not priority number one when we get attacked. The cops don't care, but we definitely still enjoy that privilege and you know, there's no getting rid of that privilege. So you might as well leverage it. And another aspect of that work is just documenting anything that happens in terms of media and outreach, in terms of legal processes, you know, evidence, and documenting things. And that's the main aspect of our work. Basically, whether it's joining shepherds in the field, whether it's joining Palestinians working their own land, or even 
stay midnight in the Palestinian home if they have reason to believe that there will be a demolition or settler presence. The majority of the activism that we do is just leveraging our literal bodies and existence to just be in a place and use our Jewish presence as a deterrent from violence. Yeah, no, that sounds like really important work. Just one last question before you can share a little bit about your journalism. How can Jews not living here, and non-Jews, of course, but how can we support activists, whether they be Israeli or Palestinian, here on the ground, from your perspective? It's funny, people ask me that a lot, and I struggled with the answer for a long time because I've never spent time in that side of things, so I didn't really have an answer, even though as an American, people expect me to. So I recently have come to the conclusion that, to me, the most important role that international Jews have, especially speaking from my experience, left-wing American Jews need to make Palestinian liberation and justice for Palestinians a partisan issue. Being a Democrat who supports unconditional aid to Israel should be like being a Democrat who supports restriction on abortion. It should be an oxymoron. You should not be able to exist in the Democratic Party without having a much firmer stance against the atrocities being committed by the Israeli state and army. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely true. And thinking more broadly beyond America, I think that is equally true for the Labor Party. I know the Labor Party is unequivocally pro-Israel at this point, and probably in other places that is as well something that is deeply important. Just to wrap up, could you say a little bit about your journalism, just briefly, and where people might be able to find you? Yeah, definitely. I do freelance journalism with a few different publications, most notably with a publication called Plus 61J and with an American magazine called The Progressive. And most of my work is about combinations of my activism and highlighting certain prominent actions or groups of activists or events on the ground in the region from my perspective. If you Google Sam Stein, I am not the first person that comes up. <laughs> But if you add certain qualifiers like Israel or the names of the papers that I just named, you should find me pretty quickly. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Before we get into this last clip, which as I mentioned at the beginning, was a candid conversation that was accidentally recorded from inside my pocket while we were in Masafariata. I wanted to give a few thank yous, notably to the Center for Jewish Nonviolence, CJNV, for setting up and for running the delegation. They do a delegation like it every year, as well as a couple other programs, and it's an incredible organization because they are concretely organizing. It's not at all ossified or crystallized, and by joining their delegations or any of the other programming that they do, you can really plug into the networks that they've been building with Palestinian activists, with Jewish activists on the ground. And it's a really incredible experience because just after a, about a week and a half, I now have so many contacts with people on the ground that if I go back or want to be in touch with them, I can. And CJNV has really spent so much time building this infrastructure. That's so important if we want to have peace. If any of this has sounded interesting to you, I genuinely could not recommend their programming enough as it is eye-opening and life-changing. I also wanted to thank Sam and Louisa for letting me interview them over the course of the delegation. And I wanted to make a big thank you to Allie Halpert, who let us use her beautiful song, Baby Bird Nagoon, to give this episode a little bit more pizzazz. So just thank you, Allie. We really appreciate it, and we hope that we can meet you at some point in the future. So without further ado, enjoy this last clip, and I hope it can help you soak in some of the radical vibes we experienced over the course of the delegation. You didn't eat? Uh, I, I, I'm sleeping in spies, so I'll just eat over there. No, no, is there, is there extra food? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't want to see, okay, thank you. Apparently there's some food that they're offering. I don't know how much. Is there any? I don't want to take. Is there extra? Thank you. How has your time been here? I'm just so impressed by like the hospitality and just how welcoming everyone's been here. It's really like flies in the face of all the shit people say about Palestinians. That's just racist and not true. Something really hit me when in the other village we were talking about how how uh, 
And people have no hatred in their heart. But what Israel does to them puts hatred into their heart. Like you're demolishing people's schools, denying people wells, destroying their clinics and houses and roads. Like people are gonna be pissed, rightfully so. Yeah. Sure. You eat as much as you want. Eat after. Okay, sure. It's just easier. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's like good. <laughs> they have their own. <laughs> but is that kitty cat as friendly as the one in Spy? Because the one in Spy slept between my legs and was cuddling with me. It was very friendly. It did try to steal my bed from me, but <laughs> and kind of woke me up multiple times. But it was cute at least. <laughs> you don't have a cat at home. No, I don't. To be honest, I've like historically I've not been super comfortable around cats because their whole like claws thing, <laughs> and sometimes being complete dicks. But that cat was like so friendly that I like was like happy to be friends with it. <laughs> Where are you from originally? I was born and raised here. You were born and raised here. Oh, were you just speaking Russian? Yeah, yeah, you know Russian? From home. Mm, are your parents from Russia? From Ukraine, but... Ukraine? Yeah. yeah. But spoke Russian? Yeah. Yeah, the whole Soviet Union thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, really thought they were going to be, like, annoyed that we came here. <laughs> and then they've just been like, <laughs> eat. <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. Roman, how do you identify politically, out of curiosity? I would say I'm a communist. But I'm this taken by, monopolized by Marxist-Leninists. Yeah, no, I feel, I, I'm, I'm in the same camp. I'm in the same camp. Yeah. Democratic confederalism, like... Uh, Fiction. Power from the, for the municipalities and yeah. organization of power Modular. in the municipalities. Who, like, I, uh, I've not been in Anjalan, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's also just... Uh, <laughs> uh, He's just rehashing Bookchin's theories. What? You know Murray Bookchin? No, Bookchin. I mean, the democratic confederalism of Ojalan is based off of uh, Bookchin's libertarian municipalism and social ecology. So, uh, it also depends because uh, a lot of uh, anarchists uh, think that these things are organized by the small community. I mean, uh, muni municipality got to be organized uh, like you choose people from the neighborhood. You choose people from the neighborhood, uh, they got to be the deputy of the uh, neighborhood. So that. I don't want to be the deputy of the neighborhood. Like what? Like what? Water, then uh, they will go to the neighborhood and from the neighborhood to the city council. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, and, and the more important thing that it's not the party system, they can be. Uh, Direct uh, democracy. Uh, they can be the party, yes, but it's uh, not the party. Choose who will be the, in the next election. So it's uh, the party. Yeah. And also they can put them uh, out of the election every time that they, uh, that they need. Yeah. I mean, that's honestly. See, like exactly where I'm at. I went through like a Leninist phase and then I've been like moving like I kind of like am rather anti-Leninist. I've been around a lot of Trotskyists lately and they piss me off. The whole like the whole party line thing and like democratic centralism I just find not democratic and like kind of just reproducing the line through like dogmatic um, what I don't know if you know Paulo Freire, he's a pedagogue, a Brazilian, Paulo Freire. Like what he called the banking model of education, where you have a teacher that is expected to have all the knowledge, and then a student that just passively absorbs the knowledge, and they just, the, the teacher makes deposits into the student. And, like, uh, like, he just gives them knowledge. And, and it's like, it's completely disempowering, and Paulo Freire makes the point that that is the way of teaching, that is the way of teaching of the oppressor, not the oppressed. And the way of teaching of the oppressed is about empowering people to be able to liberate themselves. And that's why I, 
I'm kind of an anarcho-communist. <laughs> I mean, like, Kropotkin was good. I wish he'd played a bigger role in the Russian Revolution. Unfortunately, he was confined to his, his little house. I don't even know where it was, but in the middle of nowhere. Was that in Moscow? I thought it was more remote than that. I think I might I like I have read stuff but it's been a long time. I just wish that that model of communism had uh, one out instead. But I would say I'm not thinking that uh, it's really anarchistic because uh, after the municipality they got to choose someone to represent two other municipalities down to the up and then not yep. from the up to the down but yep. and also they can choose to make uh, one uh, valuta cut uh, currency, one currency for the old state. Yeah. So it's like state. Uh, okay. It's state. It's just state organized by the other, other way. Yeah. It's not centralized. Like what the what do you think of what the Kurds are trying to do in Rojava, Syria? I'm, I'm not. I like know a little, but I'm not really know a lot about what they exactly done about yeah. how does it really work. Yeah. I've seen some stuff, but I've also heard. I've had conversations with like a anti-Assad, like Syrian nationalist, like being like, oh, the Kurds, it's all a lie, it's, a, it's not real. Not, it kind of confuses me. Not That's what I've heard, and I'm like, that, that just doesn't hold up to like things I've seen on videos, and like maybe you can't trust videos and stuff, but like, it just seems very uh, nationalist. Line. I know, I know one guy like this mm -hmm. that thinks that all the Arabs got to unite in one nation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, isn't that like what Nasser wanted in the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they for the big Syria, they tell that the Kurds are also Arabs, just a, uh, like my friend, they just out of the mountains. Yeah, no, it's definitely. It was weird. Like, I'd never talked to someone like that. And then the other, it was like a couple weeks ago, I was chatting with this guy. And then his girlfriend, who is an Azerbaijani anarchist, and like there were they, yeah, she was in. She was, I met her in England, um, but it, it was just weird because like she was pushing back a lot to what her boyfriend was saying, like that's not true, and I was like, it was very weird conversation, very interesting conversation. Yeah, he's a Syrian anti-Assad was like, oh, like the Kurds should have just been behind the revolution. They're just fucking shit up. They betrayed it by working with the Americans and like that sort of stuff. Which like, if you got to have guns, so you will work with yeah, like they have literally like look at the reality. Like they're in a war situation. They have no friends. Turkey will would not give uh, guns to the Kurds. Yeah. China will not. Russia will not. Yeah, they have no friends. Like, if even like, yes, the U.S. is clearly in it for personal and national interests. But like, at the end of the day, like, does that really? Is that their choice? Like, they don't have any other options. Like, yeah, it's all kind of fucked. I really, it's hard to see a, a positive future for the Kurds in Russia. One can hope, but. Might be a fool, so. Was that in Moscow? I'll take a little bit. <laughs> I don't want much, just like a couple of